Okay. Yes, I can see your slides. Excellent. Okay. So thank everybody for coming to the uh, SFT summer workshop on open education resources. Um, Eric and I are both um, currently working in the library, um, although we are also both on the um, Open Textbook and Education Resource Committee, which I'll, we'll talk about more in, in a little bit. But this, this workshop is mainly to, to give you guys an overview on what OERs are um, and, and where we're going with them. Um, it also will give you an idea of, of what resources that, um, that we have available here at Stockton. Um, Eric, do you want to advance the slide? Yeah, oh, oh sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can see we practice this intensely before we got going. Um, so we're going to introduce you to the things we have here at Stockton for OER resources and services um, later on in the session. Um, so I'm going to start off by giving you a brief overview of what an OER is. For those of you that don't know, um, OER stands for Open Education Resources. So that's any sort of um, teaching, learning, research medium that you use um, that resides in the public domain that can be uh, easily accessible for, for no cost to your students or, or, or pretty much anyone else um, without any limitations. So uh, it, it, we broaden that out to include things like um, anything that we provide and, and other libraries do this too, anything that you provide to your constituency for free. So all of our databases that we provide for free um, would fall under that under that umbrella. Um, we think of, of the open part of OER as, as content that you can take and retain. You can keep a copy of it. You can revise it, edit it, do what you want with it, remix it, um, to, you know, move around chapters or, or change the video, um, reuse it in your classrooms uh, every semester if you want, and then redistribute it um, to anyone you'd like. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the whole copyright thing in a minute, but the whole reason that we're involved in this is because the New Jersey legislature um, back in 2019 passed a law and um, it talks about open education resources and what we need to do as an institution to adhere to this law. So it means that we had to have a committee, which we do. Um, it also means that we have to have a plan, which we do. And we also try to expand the use of open education resources at our institutions, which is um, part and parcel of, of why we're presenting today, but also why we want to encourage you all to use um, open textbooks and, and materials in your classrooms, um, because it really it really helps students. And that's that's the portion of the bill that that really isn't highlighted is the fact that this is really not because you know the New Jersey legislature thought it was this great idea. It's because it actually helps students. That's the great idea about it, is that it it, it helps students achieve better um, uh, grades in the classroom, and it it helps them at home too because they don't cost anything. And we'll delve delve a little deeper into those those things. But first, we wanted to to open it up for discussion on what you've, how you've observed your students struggling with textbook affordability and what um, impacts you've witnessed on the rising costs of higher education. So um, we'll just put those, I'll put those questions in the chat for you, but we wanted to open it up for discussion. Uh, yeah, Heather, sounds looks like you. I've had 
you know, I'm, I've been coordinating the first year studies program. And as, as many of you know, students have to pass our first 1000 level classes in two tries or they're dismissed from the university. And unfortunately, very sadly, over the past years, few years, and we've had an increasing number of students each year face this, some students have failed in one of their two attempts because they did not have a textbook. They could not afford the textbook. Typically this has been um, usually for a math class because the online textbook and um, homework problem system is quite expensive. Sometimes faculty don't realize this right away because students sign up for a free trial period. So it appears that they're in the system and everything is going okay. And then the trial period ends Sometimes these have even been students who are in the EOF program and can get assistance with purchasing um, books. But the problem is that the way in which they can be reimbursed is very clunky. So if they have to purchase something with a credit card, they have to have a credit card, which they do not all have a credit card. And then they have to be reimbursed. So this is like, I've had students who wrote to me saying, well, we finally found a family friend who will let us use their credit card. You know, this is like in October, they're telling me, so I can purchase this book so that I can take my math quizzes and tests. Well, I'm thinking, you know, you're already down to like a 50% in this class and you're so far behind, you're gonna fail. And, we just should save your money at this point. So I, this is kind of the worst case scenario, but numerous students have failed these courses and other courses across the university, um, foreign language courses, math and science classes, economics classes, because they can't afford their textbooks. And that's really, it's just really a shame that that, that, that occurs. I'll, uh, there's a comment in the chat. Um, uh, looks like, uh, unfortunately, uh, Licia's um, mic and camera are offline. So I'll just read the, the text comment out loud. Um, sounds like in PT, uh, our students have high book costs per semester. We try to use the textbooks in multiple courses, but we are finding that many do not purchase the textbooks. Um, any other observations or anecdotes that anybody would like to kind of throw in? Um, it's kind of a, a I think, a, a growing field. I was just told, um, I also adjunct at ACCC, and their English department's moving, I think, to all OER books. They're not going to have any um, purchased texts instead of doing the all open resource. Um, personally, I've seen students have to choose between buying books and housing or taking care of their children. So I have no problem with it. I think it's a great idea. Textbook manufacturers are really um, putting a lot more money on it. And then if you go to Amazon to pick up your textbook cheaper, you often have to wait two or three weeks. So then the students still behind. I think it's very interesting. Um, and certainly um, for as much of, you know, a lot of the R&D work um, that tends to come out of higher ed typically happens at a lot of like universities or, you know, R1 institutions and things like this. But in this particular case, I think a lot of the, the biggest uh, advances seem to be coming out of community colleges um, in terms of OER work because um, there are at some entire curricula that are being built, structured around like OERs as learning resources. Um, so it just, it definitely seems like um, a, likely because of a practical point of need, um, community colleges are actually doing a lot of really, really great work with developing OERs and like integrating them into courses and things like that. And by necessity. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Heather has some more comments in the chat. Um, she adds that their faculty is working to use OER, but it takes a lot of time investment for faculty members in the first few years. Um, she's done the same with her college writing classes, which she could do as someone with 12 or 20 plus years of experience teaching, but it's a, a lot for contingent faculty who teach the majority of our, our first year writing courses to do, to use OERs. Um, and then Kathleen said that sometimes students will, t will purchase a much older edition. Yeah. Um, to quickly address, I see uh, Mike, you asked a question about like, is there resources for kind of consolidating OER material? There are, um, and in just a few minutes, you will be seeing some uh, firsthand, uh, so a little teaser of what's what lies ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, Kate uh, mentions uh, art history books are expensive, so I always allow earlier editions. Um, yeah, art history books, wow, boy, they can really get pricey. Um, and so, yeah, the uh, earlier editions, they always, they, they definitely help. Um, and, you know, usually there's a pretty steep drop off in like the cost from Particularly if you're going, I mean, if you're going from new to used, but then if you're going from just the current edition to a previous one, there's usually some cliff that the the pricing kind of takes a nosedive off of. Um, so yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I guess in the interest of time, we should probably shuffle back over to the. Oh, one yeah, last thing, um, mm -hmm. Robin commented that um, she often allows students to come borrow her textbook to copy or. Uh, scan um, your your own personal textbooks. Um, the and that's one other thing that you could do is if you have an extra copy of your textbook, you can actually bring it to the library and put it on reserve for your students for the entire semester, and then they can do the photocopying and scanning without having to bug you in your office or find you. Um, it's always going to be here for them. Yeah, it's uh, definitely course reserve is, is an option for making things a little bit more manageable and affordable for students. Um, and it's it's typically something where it's not even like, it, it can be a very minimally intrusive thing that a, a faculty member can do. They can just, you know, have they like, lend the library their personal copy of the text for the course of the semester. We give it back at the end. And in the meantime, students have access to a like, uh, an accessible and scannable copy if they need to to get a hold of it on short term notice. Um, all right, so let me there we go. Um, huh, look at that. Give me just a moment, folks, <laughs> while I figure out. Interesting. All right. Um, not working quite as minute. I expected. Okay. And why is this? Huh. Well, all right. Um, let me, looks like one of my charts is not formatted properly for display. I'm just going to roll with it and so we're just going to do this for a moment. Um, it is slightly reduced in size, but um, you hopefully will be able to tell some of the some of the information because this chart will not display in presenter mode apparently. Um, so uh, this is some uh, chart of some information and data that was taken from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, covering January two thousand six through July two thousand sixteen. Um, it tracks the different rising costs of um, various uh, expenses um, associated with, with school. Um, the one that I definitely want to direct your attention to in case the print on the different uh, lines is a little too small, the one that is uh, this yellow line that is exponentially higher than the others, uh, that is college textbook costs. Um, over the course of that, a uh, 10 year span from 06 to 16, um, college tuition and fees increased totally about 63%. Um, 
And oh, well, all right, look at that. It's working now. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> um, I don't know what you did, but it worked. So good. Um, there, um, there is overall a 21% increase for all items in total, but over that period, there was an 88% increase uh, for college textbooks specifically. Um, so not surprisingly, um, the expense of college textbooks continues to climb um, with time. So um, one thing that I often like to kind of call back to, it's nice to have these general statistical pieces of data, but um, having something you can do that is directly addressable to uh, Stockton specifically uh, is always helpful, getting a little insight into how things are here. Um, in 2019, the library conducted uh, a survey. It's a textbook assignment usage, it's a textbook assignment purchasing and usage survey. It was actually two smaller surveys that we sort of amalgam together uh, for this report. Um, at one point, we polled faculty members uh, regarding how they assign textbooks and approximately like how much the textbooks were that they would assign in any given semester. And then separately, we polled students regarding how they purchased and actually used uh, textbooks in uh, over the course of two semesters. Um, we found from the data that we collected um, that on average, a textbook at Stockton, um, according to respondents in the survey data, uh, that it was going to run a student about $109 average uh, per textbook. Um, of course, average textbook costs do, we found did vary pretty considerably between schools, but on average, this was about the, the middle ground. Um, and in terms of total estimated textbook costs, um, we assumed for a minute that um, you know average student enrolls in four courses per semester. They're going to be looking at about four hundred and thirty-six dollars on textbooks per term, eight hundred and seventy-two per year. Um, you know, assuming the same course-taking behavior over the course of an academic year, as, and again, assuming a four-year period, which not everyone can honestly do at a university, um, they're going to be looking at about $3,488 spent during the lifetime of, or during their time at Stockton on textbooks alone. Um, the one thing that I found that was very, very interesting um, in terms of responses from our survey is that um, of all the survey respondents, 70% uh, of them, which, which equated to about 506 uh, students, indicated that they had one or more um, from a list of potential impacts that textbook costs incurred uh, during the fall 2019 term. It was a very high number, um, including things like um, some reported, 21% reported inability to buy groceries. Uh, some were late on rent or mortgage payments, some unable to buy gas, some overdrew bank accounts. Uh, um, at least ha uh, about half of all of the respondents said that they delayed purchasing textbooks due to the financial burden that they would incur from it. Um, and uh, about 17% said so that they delayed it what, because of uh, awaiting financial aid. Um, so um, one thing that I think is an important concept to sort of introduce into this mix while thinking about um, the potential financial impacts of um, textbooks in general, uh, in terms of like traditional textbook purchasing, um, is an alternative model. Um, and in this case, uh, a lot of OER material are released under um, what are called Creative Commons licenses. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of these. You have probably even uh, worked with Creative Commons licensed material before, just in case as like a very, very broad stroke um, kind of introduction and overview of this. Um, there are six different licenses for Creative Commons. Um, seven, if you technically count uh, the generically like public domain open, like I, I think what the, I believe it's what they call a zero license. Um, 
but for the most part, they fall into these six different license types. Um, each one is characterized by um, a certain set of attributes that they're given. Um, and these are broken down into these little like acronyms here on the screen. Um, at its most simple, with a Creative Commons license, you just have to give attribution to the person whose work that is Creative Commons license you are using. You say, hey, you know, this is where I found this from. This is the person who made this. Um, and then they kind of grow from there and become more, more in-depth and involved. As you can see, they kind of add attributes all the way up to, I guess you would say, like the most restrictive for lack of a better word in terms of these licenses would include things where you must um, give attribution you um, must produce if you uh, if you reproduce any new material out of it it must be non-commercial in nature uh, so you cannot make any money off of any of the oer materials that you that you produce or remix um, from existing creative commons material um, and there is also, I want to say ND, I believe it is non-distribution. I am drawing a blank on this at the moment. Um, and uh, the other attribution is also uh, the SA is share alike, which means if you make any material based on the, this uh, previously existing material, it must be licensed under the same kind of Creative Commons license that you must perpetuate the license. Um, so uh, as you can see, I, I don't want to spend too much time delving into the, the, the depths of the different kinds of licenses, but um, this basically sets up the rules that govern how what you can do with this material and how you would like others who come across your Creative, Creative Commons license material to reuse it going forward with their own. Um, there's this, this very, very strong um, impetus on with OER materials on the idea of remixing um, that it isn't just oh I'm taking something and I'm just ex ex I, taking that exact thing and reusing it in its exact same state um, I am maybe taking half of this one um, OER that I'm finding here and then pieces of four others that I'm taking and I'm melding them all into like one new item that I am now using as a course tool. Um, that sort of repurposing and reuse is definitely like a big uh, utility for OER material. Um, generally speaking, there are four sources that the predominant large amount of OER funding tends to come from. Uh, one is universities, not surprising. Uh, universities subsidize uh, faculty to produce OERs, oftentimes through specific programs that they develop. Um, there are also things like nonprofit foundations, things like the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, um, that produce grants and other um, incentives for academics to, to produce OER materials. Um, federal and state governments, increasingly, as you are seeing um, with more recent in recent years, things like New Jersey's uh, legislation, uh, they are beginning to take an invested interest in the production of OERs and are also beginning to produce. Um, uh, Re, uh, what would you call it? Like um, drawing a blank on the simple word. Uh, pro programs that will um, incentivize uh, the production of OERs, and lastly, uh, institutional consortia, things like uh, Cali, C A L I, um, which are just consortia that are developed specifically around the promotion and. Um, pardon my phone ringing, um, promotion and uh, development of open education resources. Can jump ahead, just hopefully to, that'll. Just to jump in there um, and fully disclose, we currently do not have any OER funding at Stockton. Um, we are, we hope to be working with the, pro, the new provost on, a, get, you know, getting some OER funding so that we will have grants available for faculty members to do this kind of work, um, like other universities in the in the state have. Um, the Open NJ um, initiative is statewide um, through Vail, and we are a part of that. Um, but there again, there's no funding. It's just um, where we can actually put OERs once we once we um, create them. So 
Um, for the next thing, we would like to kind of um, spur a little discussion once again among everyone. Um, oh, hmm. I just I don't know if I, I saw it too. We're going to keep yeah. the breakout room open. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Um, so uh, for the next point of discussion, um, we're interested in um, having you all consider. Um, is there anything involving like the current materials, the course materials that you are using, either readings, textbooks, other kinds of learning tools? Um, think about them, like consider one of the ones that you use currently in your class. Is there something that you would change about one of them if you could? And what do you think you could adjust about it in order to make it better? And I'll drop those in the chat. So let me stop sharing. Have basically, have you ever had the experience of, boy, this is this is a great resource, and it would be even better if it could do X? Um, have you ever had that experience? And if so, like, what kinds of changes would you like to make? Looks like um, Michael McGarvey had a comment about editing. Um, oh, you mean sort of like paring it down to make it a little bit more essential, like focused in on just main? Right, yeah. Um, so yeah, comments of removing a few chapters that are not highly relevant to the course material, um, always extraneous bits kind of floating around in your textbook. And Michael was able to generate some videos for specific comment for content during COVID. I think a lot of us were doing that over the COVID. One of the advantages of material like OER is that um, particularly when you're dealing with something that is born digital, um, is that you have a much greater flexibility to integrate uh, non-traditional or non-print media forms. Um, so you can create learning objects that would be in things like videos, and you can actually put the video inside the OER textbook or like the, the, the particular thing that you are making, uh, what's they call it, the artifact that you are designing and producing, can contain multitudes in a very literal sense. It can have within it like all different kinds of media forms. Um, and that kind of flexibility is something that you don't always get from a purely uh, like a print medium work. Uh, and as Mary is asking, are there incentives for faculty to create textbooks through Creative Commons? Um, there are, but not at Stockton. Yet. Um, yet. Yet. Um, there will be an opportunity to partner with other individuals around the state um, in the spring, and um, I'll make sure to send out those those invitations. Um, and it it they're going to limit it to certain. Um, specific classes or subjects that they're interested in for those grants that are that are going to be um, this coming spring and that's those are statewide um, but currently at Stockton we don't have any incentives um, and, and we're hoping to change that there is an argument that could be made that there is a kind of subjective ROI to this entire thing, which is a sort of um, philosophical return that you are, or an ethical uh, incentive that, that you are that you are able to kind of cash in on, um, depending on where your particular interests and uh, feelings lie about that. Go ahead, Joe. Did you have something to add? Um, Heather 
talks in the chat about wanting guided reading questions um, and having to cobble together numerous sources for her classes. Um, Tate says editing cre and creating his own material and adding his own material to the to a website. I mean, it, it, in that sense, I mean, kind of similar to thinking about what Tate was just commenting on. It kind of reminds me of, um, I mean, in a way, there is the idea of the course packet, which is, you know, an instructor compiling readings and sort of assembling them into well, a course packet. It's, it's, it's nothing new, like in that sense. Um, it's just that this is sort of a different approach to that. Um, obviously a different kind of licensing and a very different way of um, handling things like copyright. But um, in that way, the idea of remixing is something that in a lot of ways instructors have been doing for quite some time. So it shouldn't feel all that revolutionary. Which kind of leads into our next slide, I think, Eric. Do you wanna try sharing on your end again? Sure, let me give this a go and see if, um, see if it'll play nice. Okay. Yay. So that leads into the, the different types of OERs that are available. Um, it's not just textbooks. There are books that are available. There's journal articles. There's full journals that are, are open access. Um, other different types of learning objects, whether it be podcasts, videos, um, uh, course materials, things like that. Um, and of course, uh, lumped in with that are all library resources that students can access for free as long as they're a student. So, and of course, anyone who's affiliated with Stockton can access any of our library resources um, for free and that those fall under OER for, for educational purposes. So some specific ones um, like OpenStax, I've got one here. Um, it's, I don't know, can you guys actually see my video? Cause I can't see it. <laughs> um, so the OpenStax books. There you go. If you wanna, I stop the share so that you can. Can you see? see, can you see me at all? Yeah, well, I believe so. Cause I think now we're able to, oh wait, did that? That it's yeah we're back in here so okay um you should be able to if you kind of change your view display if you want to see it in higher depth you can so you know uh, these open stacks books come in all different um uh, subjects but the students can actually get a print version the nice thing is the online version of these is up updated um usually within the semester um that it was created so if if we pop back to the slide then um eric sure thing you can see that i've pulled some stats on on one of the books um and this organizational behavior book well it was published in 2019 the web version was just updated in february um it comes in multiple different formats depending on what your students want to read it in um, there's instruction manuals, blackboard cartridges, test banks, PowerPoint slides, um, annotated video guides. There's all sorts of ancillaries that, um, that OERs are starting to add. Not all OER companies offer those types of ancillary products with the books because it's up to faculty like us to help create them. Um, so if you want to get involved with the Rice um, group, um, Joe Trout is actually one of our faculty members who has actually published with OpenStax. He's, he's a co-author um, on a chemistry text with OpenStax. So there's definitely opportunities there, but again, they're not, they're not paid opportunities. They're, they're ones we undertake as part of our, you know, uh, part of our job, really. Um, so OpenStax textbook, textbook library is another place you can look for textbooks um, and other resources. And then if we jump to the Stockton page, um, so we have uh, a page and our 
just an FYI, our website is changing, but this guide will stay at this link. Um, and I think it's changing in the next week, right, Eric? Yeah, um, th there's a, a kind of a generalized redesign for some of uh, many of the pages that you may see pop up on the library site. Um, later this week or early next week, that'll actually go live. Right. Um, but this 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 URL is going to be many of the URLs are going to be the same, just that some of the design will, will look a little different. Right. So this has all of the information on our um, OER program. Um, if we jump forward one, we have um, a list of OERs at Stockton. If you have a course that is considered zero cost, please use this zero cost course directory form. Um, and so we can add your class to that list. Um, we are going to petition the, um, the university to actually add a subscript the, called a Z subscript, which is what a lot of the um, community colleges use around New Jersey to indicate that the course is a zero cost course for when students go to register. Um, so that's part of um, what we're doing here at Stockton. And if you jump for one more slide, the Stockton um, Open Textbook and Education Resource Committee, this was um, last year's group. Um, we're going to have subcommittees this year. So if you know of any of these people on this list, there should be someone from your college represented there. Um, and we're going to have subcommittees um, that are going to be working on these different issues at Stockton. So if you want to get involved in, you know, creating funding for OER, if you want to get involved in, you know, um, um, the Z sub subscript committee, um, all sorts of different things, we'll, we'll have more information on those opportunities. And you can also reach out to anyone on this list. Um, myself and Kathy Klein, our co-chairs on the committee, um, Eric's a member, um, as our uh, um, David Lechner, another librarian, um, and other folks across the university, including some students and, and um, our bookstore manager. So it's, we're being all, you know, and staff members. So we're being, the, the open textbook community is a you know, an overarching university committee. Um, and if you'd like to get involved, please contact me. So we'd like to open it up to any questions, comments, concerns, um, reiterations. We'd love to hear them. And uh, oh, one thing, one thought that I did want to throw in on the end there, um, please do remember that if you're thinking about um, either making your course something that has no um, in, like, materials cost associated with it, um, getting on that directory, the, the, the zero cost uh, course directory doesn't purely have to be like, I'm using an OER. Um, all that it requires is that you not have like an outlay of funds from the student for course materials. Um, so that would even include like if your course, if you don't use an OER, but your course is compiled of readings that the student can access without having to pay for any of them. Um, and that there is no, you know, cost for textbook or course materials, that works too. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more broadly defined than just I am using an OER as, a, as my textbook. So um, thoughts, questions. Uh, one other thing is that um, the librarians are becoming increasingly interested in trying to work with faculty to like um, help develop or at least try to help design um, like more OER style materials. So if you are at all interested in doing any work on something or maybe trying to incorporate something into your course, reach out to um, your program liaison in the library. Um, because we are absolutely game to try to work with you. Uh, Heather had a comment in the chat about um, the frustration on funding and our administration not having funding for this type of thing and not not realizing how much time and effort it, it takes. I am in full agreement with you, Heather, and that's what 
the OTERC committee is going to try and change here at Stockton. Um, other universities across New Jersey have added grants and things that um, are available to, to faculty, and we hope that we can convince the university and provost office that, that we should have programs just like them. Yes, it is not coincidental that those institutions where these kinds of programs have taken off and have taken hold also are institutions that have incentive programs for those who are spending the time to invest in these resources. Um, yeah, yeah, not, not surprising in that way. Yes. Um, and Mary said uh, when she asked about incentives, she meant recognition in faculty files. There's um, a lack of peer review process, which doesn't lend recognition to, to um, promotion and tenure. I know when you publish with OpenStax, there, there is actually a peer review process. Um, so, and the, the grant that is being, um, the New Jersey grant that I think Passaic is the one that that is actually overseeing the grant for New Jersey um, Passaic Community College, that that, that process is going through a, the, a peer review process as well. So there will be things that you will be able to put in your file if you um, take part in these, these different efforts. Oh, uh, and quickly to answer um, uh, Kate's question about Stockton having a list of textbook type OERs that are already available. The, the library's OER guide, it doesn't have a specifically curated for individual textbooks. There, there, are, there are many, um, but the one of the pages on that guide does have uh, links to multiple different um, repositories, I, I guess I'll call them, uh, where you can find like labeling to OpenStax. Um, there's a few others, uh, Merlot is another one that comes to mind um, and the OTN that um, are basically these, these large, much more searchable and much more um, um, uh, comprehensive repositories of all of these uh, OER materials than anything we would try to like assemble and hand select. Uh, I would definitely recommend going, looking through um, any of the ones that we link to in the OER guide, look at your discipline, see what's out there, um, because there could be textbooks, but there could also be just an enormous amount of other uh, course content that would be really useful. Or something that you can take and be like, oh, this is great. If only it had this one minor change. That's the gateway. That's how, that's how you start down the path on this kind of thing. Uh, me, I'm in full agreement um, that uh, it is ironic that there's no grant stream to apply for small teaching pur purchases or, or developing teaching tools. Um, and that is definitely something that this committee will push for. Um, for sure. Um, see. Does anybody have any questions on, um, you know, uh, using OERs, where to find OERs? Um, I actually, I'm just kind of curious, um, since we since we've got a minute, um, using the show of hand, the like the, the, the little race hand thing, um, how many of you are either like have a pretty like had a foundational understanding that was at least where we were and what we were talking about today or have dealt with like have worked with OER things more? I just I'm kind of curious of like a quick poll idea of like where people are at with all of this. So like throw your hand up if you have either worked with OERs already, incorporated them in your class in some way, or like already feel like you've got a pretty decent understanding of like what they're about and what's out there. And if yeah, if you're if you're kind of like so so like either, yeah, either throw your hand up, um, make a, I just, again, I'm just kind of wanting to get a sense of like how, how like saturated the information and the knowledge and awareness of all of this is at the university. 
Cool. Well, thank you. I, I do have a question. Hmm. Um, I'd love to make my course, um, you know, non-textbook purchase, you know, whatever the terminology is, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but I use a, a grammar book, right? I'm first year studies. I've got a really nice grammar book that I like using. Um, I let them use whatever edition they can get their hands on. But again, if they don't have a credit card, it doesn't mean they can get things on Amazon. It's available for rent. Um, but I really want them to purchase it. And um, I haven't yet, and you know, you can kind of cobble things together with online stuff. Um, but are there, and I haven't had a chance to look and maybe you know offhand, uh, you know, if there's a specific grammar style guide that I want them to get, is it possible to do that as um, an open access resource or am I just sort of stuck? I, well, I guess first I'm, I'm curious to hear if anybody else like from the crowd has, have, has a thought or? I've used um, a web page uh, that's called, well, it's actually a, a whole big website, uh, Community Colleges of America. And it has this index of every grammar issue you could want. It's got quizzes, self quizzes, as well as ones that the students can do, like we can do in class together. It's. Um, can you tell me again what that's called, Lydia? Uh, yeah, I can. I can get it for you. Put the link in the chat. Oh, it's thank you. It's a great source. Um, oh, I can't do it on this one. Everybody's thank changing you. all of our our Blackboard sites. I have to go to the right one. <laughs> I mean, partially what I, what I partially the reason I ask for a, a hard book is because I'm also trying to teach them how to look things up without just typing in a search word mm -hmm. um, because a search word doesn't always get you to where you want to be like sometimes you need to see the whole index or, or the whole thing you need to learn how to use an index you need to learn how to use a table of, of contents you need to know the sections of the book that offer quick definitions, you know, I guess it just means that I have to relearn how to use an online source so I can yeah. teach them. <laughs> like, it, it, I guess, I guess I'm asking is that, is that what I'm doing? I'm teaching, I have to reteach myself how to look things up. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it just seems to me, I don't know, teaching in community college, um, they don't carry books anymore. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's a whole, they do everything on their phone. They can't be done on their phone. They can't do it. <laughs> so this can actually be run on a phone. And I get that. I, I get that. I do get that. I mean, I understand you completely. Should everything be run on a phone? Like, I don't, I guess this is a larger philosophical question, really. Yeah. I mean, my only resistance to OAR resources is that half the time they just ask the question in Google. Right. You know, and, it, and if that's the way the world is going, then maybe, maybe my lesson needs to be on how to ask the right question on Google. Like, I just don't, I just don't know. I mean, I like libraries. I like library websites. I like giving them things because then we don't have to constantly teach and reteach and reteach about what's available, what's easy, right? Like when we were in college, we went to the library. Everything in the library was relatively trustworthy, right? They put things into Google, half the shit they come up with isn't trustworthy. And they don't always pay attention to why they need to do that, right? So part of the reason I had a grammar book um, is so that I could say, look, this is a trustworthy resource that can help you with several things. It's not just grammar, it's also MLA, APA, CSE, right? What whatever they might need in another class, this is the way to do it. And a lot my students who have barred it and used it will tell other students, please, this is actually the most important book you'll use all throughout college. Um I don't know. So 
I will say. Like, and I see I, I Heather think, giving me an answer, but I can't read it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, what, to, to your point, one thing that is really important is that I, I don't, I don't, I think it is, I think it's a safe thing to say that ne neither Christy and I advocate OERs as the answer to, to, to any of these, um, particularly because at the, at, they're great resources, but then there's also, there are limitations to them. I mean, the, the perfect example that we, we come up with is if you were teaching a contemporary literary course, shockingly, there is zero OER materials out there because you are inherently dealing with an enormous amount of material that's all under copyright. Um, so there's not a resource for you. Um, and so there are these different kinds of limitations inherently based on the, like, like the nature of what we're talking about. Um, and so for that reason, th there may be things, and in this case, maybe like this, maybe the, the grammar resource you're talking about is one of these things where it, it won't be able to fit the bill. Um, and that's, that's, that's not an inherent deficit, in my opinion, of OER. It's just that it, 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 it's meeting a different kind of need and it has a different kind of utility. Um, and so in that case, um, you know, then maybe the best choice for it is to have is, is to use the particular resource. I, I I don't know. I can't speak to whether or not there's a really great grammar thing out there. But well, um, the other question that I have is it possible? Because I I actually came up with this with um, uh, Chicago, right? I mean, I had to. I was working on a book. We were using Chicago. The library did not have an updated version of Chicago, which you have since ordered for me. Thank you, Eric. And it didn't have an online version of the updated Chicago. There isn't an on, as far as I know, and because I double checked, but I did it quickly. There is no updated online MLA APA Chicago resource that is based in our library, but maybe I'm wrong. No, um, in the sense that, uh, we typically don't have, we, we don't often buy, and Christy, correct me if I'm off on any of this, but to my knowledge, we don't usually, we will purchase like up-to-date print copies of things, but we don't have online subscriptions to like digital access to like, like the APA style guide or anything like that. Um, we don't. Yeah. Um, usually because it, 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 it's, a, it's a, a recurring cost and one that would have to be factored into, not to go down a, a tedious rabbit hole, but like our ongoing subscriptions and database budgeting and things like that. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, which nobody wants to hear more about. But, um, the, uh, but yeah, like, so yeah, there, the limitation in terms of even what we've got in terms of resources are we've got like a print copy, but yeah, nothing online. Well, and, and if anybody Sometimes you have an updated print copy. <laughs> right. And we can do more of this one on one with people. Um, and all of us here at the library, um, our subject librarian, our subject liaisons to different departments. So if you don't know your liaison, just please ask and I'll put you in contact with them. But we're more than happy to work with you one on one to, to find resources that fit your course. Um, that are freely available. Um, and it, OERs are constantly evolving and changing. And some of you commented that there's not OERs um, in your subject areas. And that's true. There are some subject areas that still don't have um, decent OERs. Um, and, you know, people around the, the globe are working to try and change that. But for, but for now, they're, you know, we'll help you work within the limitations of that. So uh, we're being booted out of our our um, breakout room. So if anybody has any last questions or comments, um, please feel free to speak up. Very helpful and thank you. You're welcome. Sure. By all means, reach out to us if, uh, if anyone has any questions or if any of you have interest in exploring options like this. Um, try through your liaison librarian, but honestly, you can really talk to any of us. Yes, thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you. <laughs>